Hello, my dear comrades, my name is Dima, and welcome to another episode of my game dev vlog. Dima games. This is Dima games. One of the comments I had to my previous video is that my English is not comrade enough. Sorry about that. Luckily, I think I know the way how to improve it. Comrade, you will need to build a naval base of your own with submarines. So this time I started with organizing my tasks. I set up a Fridger account and created a task for each thing I wanted to see in my minimum viable product. By my estimation, I only need 18 working weeks to have a playable prototype, but I think I should multiply this by two. The great thing about Jira is not only having the pleasure of moving tasks to done, but also tracking time spent on my work. The first task I started was adding sound and music to my project. As the setting of my game is Europe in the 19th century, I decided to download some classical music. The great thing about that is that many classical performances can be downloaded under Creative Commons license. So I went to a random free music website, downloaded some tracks, normalized them to the same volume and converted to OGG format. Then I created a jukebox script, which extends the audio stream player. It takes all OGG files from a specified location, forms a shuffled list of them, and continuously plays every track in that list. I also created convenience key binding for skipping to next track. Then I recorded the air conditioner sound to create a background noise. After adding equalizer to the noise, changing its pitch and volume up on camera movement, I've got a great sound of a uh, jetpack. Changing pitch down on camera movement sounded better. Adding spatial audio notes with the sound of birds in the woods was a very simple task, but this added a lot of liveliness to the scene. All this works well in editor, but when I exported a game, no music appeared. Turns out Godot stores files a bit weird in the archive. Looking up import files and removing the import suffix worked well, and music now plays fine. But this sounds more like a hack than a solution. As for now, the packaging system in Godot looks much easier to me than the one in Unity. A quick pause to thank everyone who supported my first video with like and comment. You guys are great. And special thank goes to my wife Kate. Write hi Kate in comments if you want to say hi to Kate. The next thing I wanted to do is to create some tests for my code. But before that I decided to create a much smaller version of a terrain to increase game and test load time. So I did everything I did before. And of course more river to a god of rivers. After researching a topic of unit testing in Godot, I found two options, God and what. I decided to try VAT first, not only because I like memes, but also because it runs in the editor. But VAT wasn't cooperating at all. First I had to install it manually, as the version in the asset lib is outdated. Then I had a problem with parameterized tests, as in some cases they run with all parameters and in others only with one param. But the final issue was that everything froze when I tried to create a node in runtime, so I gave up on VAT and used, apparently, a more mature library, God. It only runs inside the game and does not produce GUnit compatible XML, but I can live with that. After having a sample test running locally, I decided that I want to set up a CI CD, so when I push to a repository, all tests will run automatically. I set up a GitLab runner, CI CD config, and pushed import files to a repository, so Godot editor won't need to be run before running the test. I tried that and pipeline failed with an error that OpenGL session cannot be created. So I tried with GitHub, and then with TeamCity, and nothing was working with the same error. Then I accidentally ran a GitLab runner from the command line, not as a service, as by default, and everything passed. Turns out there's some Windows security policy disallowing OpenGL usage in a service. 
So I only need to run command line in the background with the GitLab runner on Windows Startup. Easier said than done, but eventually I was able to figure out how to do this with the cmdir command line emulator. So after the pipeline was running, I was ready to write some integration tests. First, I tried to add a GUT runner as a child of my scene, but it wasn't working as I expected. So I created a scene with the GUT node only and added a logic for creating my entire game scene as a child of GUT node. This way, I'll be able to write some independent tests with the same starting conditions. So I started with a tree spawner test. I wait for a tree's planted signal, and if it happens, I check every tree node for its position. The next test was for UI panels. I hover a mouse over a control and simulate a click. Then I need to wait a frame or two to check the response of a click. I'm doing this an ugly way, just by applying a timeout. I like to look at how this test executes. It reminds me of web automation testing. I also added a unit test for the camera controller, which uses a vector.product to calculate expected camera position. And, as it usually happens, when writing a test, I found and fixed a bug with camera staggering, which occurs on low FPS. GUT looks like a great tool to me. There's a lot of assert methods for many cases you can check. Working with signals is done simply and intuitively, and parameterized tests are easy to set up and work with. So I can definitely recommend it if you're making a game in Godot. And I am 100% sure that if you want to write a piece of software which will be delivered to users, it has to have tests covering at least major cases. Mm, writing tests is not always fun, to be honest. So I spent some time to pet a cat on my bathroom break. There's a good fella. That's my boy. You may think I'm done with tests, but I'm not. With such a great success in GDScript, I decided to add some tests to my C++ library. How hard can it be, I thought. Super easy, barely an inconvenience. Oh, I was so wrong. First, I tried to add a C++ testing library to build. I tried with Sketch first and then with Google Test. But in each case, I was losing an uneven fight with CMake. Only after some long hours of learning and trying, I was able to run a sample test both locally and on CI-CD. But when I tried to write tests with an actual Godot node in it, I got crashes with some weird C++ runtime error. Not being able to continue this fight, I gave up. I think you'll need a Godot runtime to be able to create nodes and stuff. You cannot just go ahead and run a library compiled for Godot without Godot itself. In any case, I can write unit tests for C++ library from GDScript, which is a workaround. It will be good to have native C++ tests though, so I will try again later with Godot 4 extensions. Oh, all this testing makes me hungry. Welcome to the grand opening of my new section, Healthy Cooking with Tima. As you can see, I'm wearing an extra chin for an occasion. Today we're cooking chibureke. Let's start with hot water dog. Let's continue with stuffing. I have a mix of ground beef, pork, onion and the broth. Alright, it should be wet. Let's join this moist stuffing and tight top. A trick for a good chibureke is having the perfect circle. Adding a bit of oil. A bit more. And cooking them for And cooking them for 3 minutes per side. 
Okay, there is a whole emergency here. What we do? That's what he said. <laughs> That's what he said. At the green side, and here you go. A perfect healthy meal. The next thing I wanted to do is to flex my C++ muscles. I'm now learning C++, so I'm beginning to almost know what I'm doing. As my game will be grid-based, I started by implementing the grid itself. I created a grid class, which contains a vector of grid tiles, and utility methods for working with them. After compiling library and registering class in Godot, I started a project, and it crashed. I tried again with a different class name, but it still crashed. I tried eliminating a part of code, but it didn't help. Did I ever tell you what the definition of insanity is? Insanity is clicking exact same fucking button over and over again, expecting shit to change. After some time, I figured out that I was missing the init method in my class. Turns out that crashing without any message is a pretty common thing. Mostly it happens on accessing a null pointer. Pretty soon I found out that for working with C++ class from Godot, first I need to extend it from one of the Godot classes. Then add a Godot class macro to it. Also you need to add register methods and init. They can be empty, but should always be there. And then, after registering your class, everything works fine. When you implement a class, you should always accept and return Godot compatible classes from your methods. For objects, returning a regular C++ reference works fine. For arrays, elements need to be wrapped in a variant. With all this knowledge, I was able to pass a height map to my grid class and create all the tiles of the grid in the ready method. After that, I run tests, just to find out that I have a memory leak. This is because I was trying to delete tiles in a C++ way, but I should have called a free method on them instead. Having a grid connected to Godot gave me a possibility to dissolve placing buildings on a mountain. After this, I wanted to start working on roads. But to build a road in-game, you have to hit a road in real life. So me and my wife went to Kharkiv and the area for a weekend. Scared. But why? Because it's too high. I don't like to be too high this way. <laughs> So, the first step for building roads was to implement pathfinding. And this first step took so much time that I postponed roads to the next episode. I watched the OneLoneCoders video about A-Star and used his code as a starting point. 
Now let's talk algorithms. A star is an algorithm for searching for the best path from start to end node. This is done by getting each neighbor of the current node and then calculating two things, the distance we pass from the start, which is called the local cost, and the heuristic, which is the distance to a goal. These two are then summed up as a global goal value. On the next iteration, we get a node with lowest global goal, get neighbors for it, and continue until we reach our end node. Or until we visit all nodes and there's no neighbors to check. This way, we will always look up neighbors in the direction of an end node. I created a separate node struct, which contains all data needed for an A star. I have a map of these objects, and in the progress of the algorithm, I either create an instance of a node or get it from the map. After some time, I was able to get a pass array in the Godot. This is cool, but I wanted to be able to visualize my pass. Turns out, there is no simple way of drawing a line in Godot. First, I try to do this by creating an instance of a stretched cube per grid cell, but I haven't found the way to properly rotate it. Then I tried with an immediate geometry node. It looks similar to writing a shader, but with GDScript. This works, but it takes like a quarter of a second to draw, so I don't use it. Eventually, I used a trick from Godot recipes, mapping points from terrain to screen and drawing it with UI control. This is a bit of a weird way of doing this, but it works. The only downside is that a line may not be drawn on screen edge, but I can live with that. Then I created a pathfinding debug script, which saves the starting point on mouse click and calculates a pass to a mouse position every frame. After seeing the visualization, I updated the A-star move cost method to have a penalty on pass rotation, so it doesn't look like stairs. I also multiply the goal heuristic by a weight, so the algorithm moves towards the goal faster. In this case, I may not find an optimal pass. But I don't need an optimal pass. I need good performance. So I started measuring the time of finding a pass in different parts of the map. The first results were awful. It took up to 500 milliseconds to find the pass in my test. So I downloaded a very sleepy C++ profiler and started optimizing. In the code I had, a node was added to a list, and then each iteration the list is sorted to get the item with the lowest global goal. I replaced it with the multi-value tree map, as when I insert an item to it, the map is already sorted. This gave me a performance boost of 350%. Not bad. Then I replaced the heuristic function from Euclidean distance to Manhattan distance. This changed things drastically. Pass calculation became almost 10 times faster, lowering time down to 20 milliseconds. After additional optimizing, I've lowered search time twice to 10 milliseconds, which is good enough to use it on runtime. But it is very dependent on how many obstacles you have, and requires tuning. Also, the same pass, but in a different direction, gives us about 3 milliseconds. If you've implemented an A-star, please let me know if it's a reasonable timing for my map. The main purpose of the cat is to lie down beautifully. And of course, Yavnin is also welcomed. In the process of optimizing, I accidentally sorted a cute list in reverse order, which made me find the longest path instead of shortest one. Hmm, look at that. What a nice pattern. I was also looking at other ways to improve the performance of an A-star by implementing the jump point search algorithm. This is basically the same as A-star, but with different neighbor selection logic. I needed to learn, so I watched a video lecture from a wise man with a surprisingly low amount of views. It was explaining canonical orderings and jump point search itself. I tried to implement this algorithm twice, one time by myself and another by copying a code from a pathfinding JavaScript library. But both times it was about a magnitude slower than a regular A star. I think this is because I actually visit too many nodes before finding a jump point. Also, it may be a problem of absent diagonal moves. But I still want to improve pathfinding performance, so in future I want to implement a hierarchical A-star algorithm. Currently, my implementation places the path through a forest, which is not very good. So I added a reference from a tree spawner to my grid class. In the grid, I wait for a tree's planted signal. If it occurs, I go through each tree to fill the grid tiles tree list. 
After this, a tile with trees is counted as an obstacle. Also, I fixed a performance issue when the path is not found. In this case, I do a grid precalculation, where I take a node, which I call a map entrance, and start scanning the neighbors, similarly to the path search algorithm, but with no costs or end goal. This is called breath-first search. This way, I'm building a list of accessible tiles, so when I calculate a path, I won't even start pathfinding if start or end tile is inaccessible. I finish the basic A-star implementation by writing some pathfinding tests. Alright, that's it for this episode. Thank you for watching until this point. As always, you can support me with like, dislike or a comment. Subscription also helps. Have a good one. See you in a month or two. Bye-bye. Хорошо.